<laughs> Exodus chapter 8. Can I say this before I read the text? God is very interested in the why. As we just heard in the song. Why do we do things? Why? Not just that we are doing them, but the motive behind them. Exodus chapter 8, begin reading verse 1 as we continue on Sunday mornings through the life of Moses. We read in verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments, and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee, and for thy servants, and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee, and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy houses, and from thy servants, and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. And Lord, I come to you today asking you to help me to preach. Please enable me. I need a fresh filling of thy spirit. And Lord, use me as an instrument to speak to thy people. Lord, these are your sheep, and you are our great shepherd. And we know that you have a message for all of us today. May we look beyond the preacher and look to heaven's throne, the God of glory. God, speak to us today. I pray that you remove any distractions that are in this room, or that are in our minds today, and help us, Lord, to have ears to hear. Again, I ask your enablement, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, before I was saved, I worked, when I worked down in Atlantic City, uh, many of you know what I did, worked in the casinos down there. Of course, they opened up in 1978, Resorts International, and uh, I was basically still in high school at that time, but went to college for a few years and uh, saw an opportunity to kind of make a living there, and so I started to work down there, establish a family and so forth. Well, there's a man that used to come in on, on frequent occasions that... Uh, He'd come in and gamble, and we would consider him, what people would phrase, a high roller. You know, you'd say, oh, this is a high roller. Uh, this man would spend a lot of money at the table games, and he would do it very, very often. Well, when he came in, and uh, what would happen was all the attention would come to him. I mean, he walked in, people asked, you know, what did he want? People would flock around this man. Uh, he would be given free hotel rooms. Uh, if he wanted a limousine, that was available. He'd have the finest gourmet restaurants. We even had a helicopter we used to give at times to certain people if they, if they needed that. And of course, just people befriended him and hoping that they would give him some of his money. Uh, of course, employees would do the same thing. It was kind of pathetic, if you ask me, but just all over this man, almost to the point of being bothersome, 
doing everything possible to make him comfortable so that they could get a nice, a nice tip. I mean, so kind and attentive. Again, this happened on frequent occasions. Well, years later, after I got saved, uh, I went with the church that I was saved out of, Mainland Baptist Church. Uh, our pastor would go on every month. He'd take a group down uh, into Atlantic City to the Atlantic City Rescue Mission. Now, the Atlantic City Rescue Mission was a Christian organization where it was right there, and uh, right to just a few blocks from the boardwalk, and uh, they would kind of provide a bed and a meal for people that were, you know, homeless, down and outers, uh, people with no place to go. And in the wintertime, boy, they just get a whole bunch of people because it'd be cold out, people looking for a place, people that had no money and so forth. And uh, again, one of the stipulations that they had was that if you came and we gave you a bed and a meal, you had to sit through a service. You had to hear the gospel. And that was a good thing. And so they'd have churches come in and preach the gospel to them before they would uh, get their meal and get their, their bed. And, of course, we did this once a month. Well, one of the nights when he had gone down, I went with him, not all the time. Sometimes I brought our kids or we went down. Uh, but once in a while, we'd go down. But I remember one of the nights we went down, I look across the room. I couldn't believe who I saw. I saw that man. At first, I thought, no way. This has to be somebody that kind of looks like him. And I'm looking at him and looking. Well, come to find out, uh, it, it was him. They are sitting all by himself there, that man I knew from the casino. And I found out that he had gambled all of his money away. Everything. He lost his money, he lost his business, he lost his family, uh, he lost his home, I mean, you name it. But even the sadder fact of the matter is that at that particular time, all of a sudden, no one was asking if he needed anything. Nobody was flocking around him anymore. Nobody was begging anymore to be his friend. Nobody cared for him anymore. It's amazing to me. I really felt sorry for the man. I, I really did. Because it was very obvious that the people that used to flock around him were doing so for the wrong reason. They, they, it wasn't him they were interested in. It was what they could get from him that they were interested in. And you know, we can do the same thing with God. It can be not about him, but about what we can get from him. And that's exactly what we find happening here, I believe, here in Exodus chapter 8. Notice two verses of our text. We read in verse 8, the Bible says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Notice the reaction here. Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And then notice in verse 15, there's a complete change of heart. We read, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Notice a phrase, when he saw there was respite, there was relief, and I'll get to that in a minute. This morning I want to preach on the subject of this, seeking God for the wrong reasons. Seeking the Lord for the wrong reasons. Now, for the past three chapters, uh, Moses and Aaron here have been facing off with the most powerful man in the world. I mean, this was the Pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Egypt. Now, you know that Moses has been called of God to be the instrument that God would use to deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. But remember, before Moses could take one step towards Egypt, you remember that God had to do a tremendous work in Moses' own heart. He had to deal with Moses himself. Moses had to get to the place where he feared God more than he feared Pharaoh, where he feared God more than he feared all the false gods of Egypt, where he feared God more than he feared the magicians and the entire Egyptian empire. You see, Moses had to get to the place where he truly saw God as the almighty, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipresent one, the true and living God. He had to get to that place. Now, it took 80 years to do that. A long time and four chapters of the Bible to accomplish this. But by the time we get to chapter 5, Moses is finally ready to boldly go to march into Pharaoh's courtroom knowing that he was God's man and he was delivering God's message. 
Now, there's a whole sermon behind that, but I'm going to move on. Now, now here in chapter 8, uh, Moses and Aaron are going to once again face off with Pharaoh. Now, for the fourth time. This is meeting number four. Now, the first time, it was simply words. He just said to Pharaoh, uh, Thus saith the Lord, let my children go, in chapter 5 and verse 1. And, of course, Pharaoh didn't do it. The second time, it was words and a miracle. If you remember, Aaron's rod, as he tossed it on the ground, uh, turned into a serpent. And again, that second time, uh, still, Pharaoh did not let the children of Israel go. Uh, the third time, God stepped it up a bit, if you will. We see uh, Moses and Aaron using words, and then we see the first plague. The first plague was when uh, God uh, turned the Nile River into blood. And that wreaked havoc in the nation of Egypt and reveal God's power over the false gods of the Nile. But each time, each of these times so far, Pharaoh has hardened his heart and he has refused to let the children of Israel go. Now here this fourth time that I just read in chapter 8, we're going to see again both words, but now a second plague. A different kind of plague that God inflicts upon Egypt. You say, what is it? Well, you just saw what it was. Frogs. Frogs. What in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, I'll get to that. But let's never forget, let's, let's keep our mind straight on this thing, that God's declared purpose for these plagues, why was he doing that? It was really twofold. Don't miss it. Twofold. In other words, we could use two words. One would be redemption. The other would be revelation. In other words, first, to redeem Israel from Egyptian bondage. And then secondly, to make himself known to the entire world. Not just to Israel, but yes, Israel. Not just to Moses and Aaron, but yes, Moses and Aaron. And not just to Egypt, but yes, to Egypt as well. In other words, he wanted the, all of them to recognize that he is the one true and living God. And we read that declared purpose in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 4 and 5. He says this, this is God, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgment, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And may I say this, can I interject this here this morning, is that God still has the same twofold purpose. Still the same thing today in principle. Uh, God is redeeming the lost. We read in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, who gave himself, speaking of Jesus Christ, for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. God desires that all men be saved. If you're here this morning and not saved, I hope you trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Because that is what God is doing in this world. He wants all men to be saved. But there's another thing that he's doing, and that is this. He will and is making himself known to the entire world. Now today, you may be sitting here saying, wow, this world is getting pretty rough. And it is. And there are many in this world that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many in this world that would sneer at a church service like this, where the Bibles preach. They would sneer at people like us that say we believe the Word of God to be God's literal words for mankind. Amen? And there are many out there today that refuse to acknowledge God's existence. But do you know that one day all of that's going to end? That's right. That's right. Every knee, every human being that ever existed will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's right. To the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, you know it, that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So in this story, we could say, at least by application, that Pharaoh could picture someone whose heart God is trying to reach, whether it be an unbeliever or perhaps even a, a backslidden Christian. And then Moses, we could say, 
could picture the believer trying to give that message there. And we see in our story, as I've said already, uh, that Pharaoh is going to seek the Lord, but he's going to seek the Lord for the wrong reasons. Now let's see if we can't look at several lessons that we can learn from this second plague. Oh, there's all kinds of lessons we can learn for us today as uh, believers. First of all, notice number one, the directive uh, to Moses. God tells Moses uh, to do something. Notice in verse one, and the Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Now notice what's happening here. God, for the first uh, five verses, God is telling Moses what to do. And he's telling Moses, really, in a sense, what's going to happen. But once again, in verse 1, uh, God commands Moses to go be before Pharaoh. Now watch this. And to deliver to him the same message. I mean, it's the same thing. The very same message. He says, go say this. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. Not about you, but if I were Moses, I would probably be thinking something like this. Lord, we already did that. We, we said that. I mean, I did that a couple times. Matter of fact, I did it three times. I use just about the same words. And uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, uh, hey, don't you remember when I said that, how he responded? Uh, remember that he, uh, he mocked your name and he didn't budge one bit? Maybe, maybe, God, maybe we should change the message. Maybe we should tweak it a little bit. Maybe we should try something from another angle or deliver it in a different way. Maybe if we were just a little bit less offensive and forthright to Pharaoh, maybe it'd go over a little better. But you notice God doesn't do that. Right. He doesn't do that. He commands Moses to give the same message. You see, it's the same message with the same objective. Same thing. Now, isn't that what God tells us to do today? We're to do the very same thing. Mark 16, 15 says this, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You see, God commands you and I as believers, those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, to tell people the same message, and that is the gospel message. That's right. It's the same thing. Right. It's a real simple message, too. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, that the gospel is really three things. It is the death of Jesus Christ for the sins of mankind, and his burial, and his resurrection. We are to tell people the fact that all men are sinners, and that all men are condemned to hell because of our sin, but Jesus Christ died for all men. He paid our sin debt in full and that if any man in this world will repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will be saved. You see, that's the simple, same message that God has commanded us to deliver. It's the same message with the same objective. I like Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the message, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You see, it's the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel message of Jesus Christ that is the power of God the dynamite of God that will explode in a man's heart. Right. It is that message. But you know, sometimes because people reject the gospel or they resist the gospel, some Christians get the idea, well, maybe we should go about it a different way. Maybe we shouldn't be as confrontational. Maybe we shouldn't give out those little piece of papers that have scriptures on it. Maybe, preacher, we should kind of soften it up a little bit. Maybe, maybe, maybe deliver it in a, in a more palatable way. Or uh, maybe we can even surround it by worldly music. Or surround it uh, using watered-down words. Why don't we try that? Maybe if we do that, people will accept it. That's a wrong thing to do. That's not what God told us to do. Not 
at all. It must be the same message with the same objective. The gospel still works, amen? amen. We don't have to change it or alter it or try to make it more palatable. We just have to uh, deliver it. But, you know, we can also make the same mistake with the preaching of his word. Right. You know, we're supposed to preach the entire counsel of God, every bit of it. From Genesis to Revelation. You know, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I mean by that, uh, the Bible means by that, uh, the Bible has everything we need to live the Christian life. It addresses every area of life. It addresses marriage. It addresses how to raise your kids. Uh, it addresses Bible doctrine. It addresses who Jesus Christ Christ is and who God is. But it's interesting that there are certain uh, topics that people don't want to hear preaching about. I mean, you could talk about things that I like, but when you start cutting into my personal life, hey, buddy, you need to stop that right there. No, wait a minute here. Uh, there shouldn't be anything we should be afraid to preach about. Now, certainly it ought to be done in the right spirit, with a kind heart, and we should have as much compassion as we do conviction. No doubt about that. But we need to preach the entire counsel of God. We need to preach about Bible versions. We need to preach about the doctrines of the Bible. We need to preach about Christian standards of living. We need to preach about things like faithfulness to church and tithing. Uh, uh, because God tells us to preach the Word. We're not to alter it. We're not to change it. Again, the same message with the same objective. Oh, so many churches today are getting away from Bible preaching. Oh, we'll throw a verse out there and run off on some rabbit trail and tell a bunch of stories that have nothing to do with the Word of God. That's not preaching the Word. Amen. We are told in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Amen. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He warns us and says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So what do we do? Do we alter the message? Do we soften it up? Do we change the words? Do we surround it with worldly music? No! We just simply preach the word. Amen. That is the directive God gave to Moses. Same message, same objective. Notice, secondly, not only the directive to Moses, notice the display of God. Well, God's going to do something here. Pretty interesting, too. He accompanies this message with a miraculous event. Can I say this? God could bring frogs out of Silver Lake to cover Dover. That's right. But there's a greater miracle that he performs than that. And that is the change he performs in the life of a person when they get saved. That's right. What a miracle that is. The regeneration of a soul takes a person that was on their way to hell and forgives them. Amen. Places their feet upon a rock. Amen. Changes a life. But here he chooses to accompany this message with this miraculous event. He has Aaron, notice in verse 6, and Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantment and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. And so Aaron, of course, stretches out his hands, no doubt in my mind, although the text doesn't say it, he, he had the rod of God in his uh, hand and he stretches it I'd imagine again over the Nile River and when he did this and the Bible says an abundance of frogs came out of the rivers God causes all the frogs that were not only in the Nile River but also in all the streams and rivers and ponds all throughout Egypt all these frogs started coming out onto the land now can you imagine that that'd be pretty freaky <laughs> I mean, I don't like slimy stuff. I just don't. Frogs, bats, <laughs> snakes, you know, you can have them. I, I don't want them. I mean, one's bad enough. But imagine these things were everywhere. Put yourself in their place. They were in their houses. Couldn't get them out of the house. I mean, you're walking around your house trying to get rid of these things. You know, get them out of here. They were everywhere. The Bible says they were in their servants' houses. They were jumping, no doubt, all over their bodies. Ew, ew, ew. Can you imagine that? These things jumping all over the place. 
I mean, that'd be crazy. I mean, they were probably stepping on them. The Bible says here they were in their beds. Imagine, I'm going to bed. Ah! Frogs everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere. They go to put something in their oven to cook. Frogs come out of their ovens. They go to make some bread in their kneading troughs. Frogs were there. The Bible says in verse 6, they literally covered the land of Egypt. So why did God do that? Why frogs? Well, what do frogs have to do with anything? Well, there's always a purpose that God does things. Now, sometimes he doesn't reveal that purpose. And we just have to trust him by faith. But I think here, if you do a little digging, you'll find out something. And that's this. The frog was actually worshipped by the Egyptians. They worshipped the frog. You say why? Let me give you a little background. The Egyptian year was, and I think it still is, I'm not positive on that, it's divided into three seasons, four months each, four months, four months, four months. The first season is called Akhet, A-K-H-E-T. That is what is referred to as the inundation season. That's from June to October. Then they went into what's called Peret, P-E-R-E-T. That is from October to January. That's where they did their sowing. Then the third season was called the Shemu, S-H-E-M-U. That was from February to May. That was when they did their harvesting. So you have the inundation season, the sowing season, and then the harvest season. Now, Akhet was called the inundation season because every year without fail, now this was back in ancient Egypt. Today there's dams that they have set up on the Nile River. It doesn't happen quite the same way. But every year without fail, the Nile River would overflow. Every single year. It was so regular that the Egyptians actually, uh, they set their calendars uh, by it. Now remember that the Nile River is the, and was, and is the only source of water in Egypt. What's interesting about it, if you look at a map and you see the, where it flows in the Mediterranean and all that, or the water up there, it actually flows from south to north. It flows that way. That's just the way it is. Without the Nile River and without the flooding of the Nile, there would be no food in Egypt. None at all. They couldn't eat. They live basically outside of the Nile in the Sahara Desert. I mean, it's dry. It's barren. Civilization could have never existed without the flooding of the Nile. So again, this flooding in their mind produced life for the nation of Egypt. But another thing that this flooding produced was, guess what? Frogs. Because when that water came in during that flooding season, that would be the time that the frogs reproduced. And they reproduced by the millions. I mean, there were frogs. Now, they stayed in the water primarily and on the edge and so forth. So seeing the massive reproduction of frogs every year and the flooding of the Nile, the Egyptians came to believe that there was a goddess that caused that. They thought this must be the work of a goddess, and they named that goddess Heket, H-E-K-E-T. Heket, this goddess, was the goddess of fertility, the goddess of reproduction. Heket, you'd still see pictures of this false goddess all throughout Egyptian writings and drawings because uh, Heket had the body of a woman and the head of a frog. You may have seen them. And they worshiped Heket, now watch this, as being the giver of all life. Can you imagine how God felt about that? Uh, the giver of all life. They believed that she was the one who actually breathed the breath of life into every newborn child or every newborn being at their birth. They thought Heket has to do that. Uh, so in ancient Egypt, understand something, they had statues of Heket everywhere. They mentioned Heket on some of their pyramid writings. You could still find it uh, in the extant writings today. They named their children after Heket. 
and they called their midwives, those that gave birth or helped in the birthing process, they called them the servants of Hecat. So again, the frog was worshipped as a symbol of Hecat, as a symbol of life and fertility. So understand, when God brought this plague, he was actually doing two things. The first thing was this. He was proving his power over the false gods. He was proving that he is the true and living God, and they are nothing. But he also was doing this. He was proving the foolishness of worshiping anything else but the true and living God. I can imagine God up in heaven, and I'm not claiming to speak what God would speak other than from his word, but I can imagine him saying something like this. Okay, you want frogs? I'll give you frogs. You're worshiping this frog? Here you go. Worship away. You're going to have them in your bed. You're going to have them in your house. You're going to have them in your ovens. You're going to have them in your kneading troughs. They're going to be everywhere. Frogs, 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 frogs. Until somebody's going to cry out, Somebody get rid of these frogs! That's what he was doing. He's trying to prove the foolishness of their idolatry. You know, Exodus 20 and verse 3 says this, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's a simple phrase. But imagine that. No other gods. And I want us to think for a moment of all the things that we and our nation have allowed to become an idol in the place of the true and living God. All kinds of things. We have become a nation of idols. Absolutely a nation. You know, there's no lack of religion in our country. There's a lack of truth in our country. Now, everybody has something they think is their God. You see, our culture today says this. Uh, they say, we don't need God. We don't need Him. We're doing just fine without Him. In fact, we don't need God because we have things like science. We have things like education. We can just educate ourselves and we'll do fine without God. We have things like the government. The government will take care of us. That's, that's all we need. We have all the material things we need. We have our gadgets. We have our vacations. We have our pleasures. Who needs God? We have our quest for money. We have our big homes. If there's a problem, we can go to a psychologist. He'll pat us on the shoulder and say, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. So, uh, I'm so sad to say that it was your mother that tortured you when you were a baby or that said some things uh, that she shouldn't have said and you have a reason to act the way you act and so it's okay and go we have that you see we have the psychology we have the therapist we have the experts that write books on every kind of subject yes you, you see all of these things in our nation have taken the place of the true and living God in people's lives we're idolaters and I think God has allowed us to see very clearly the frogs all the things that result of our idolatry. Think about it. People's lives today, the homicides that occur today, the ruthless uh, disregard of life that exists today, marriages that are falling apart, families that are falling apart. Uh, the, he's showing us very clearly what a nation without him brings. You know, we have more problems today than we've ever had. Uh, we have more uh, since we've existed as a nation. There's more crimes today than we've ever had. There's more immorality. There's more diseases. There's more poverty. There's more debt. There's more do government dependency. There's more broken families. There's more divorces. And there's more natural disasters. You know what it's a result of? You know it. Turning our backs on the true and living right. God. You want frogs? You want to put an idol there? You want to worship this? Here you go. See where it leads you. See, God is waiting for us to say, I've had enough, okay? The psychologist doesn't have the answer. Uh, the, the therapist doesn't have the answer. Popping a few pills at night just to make me forget my problems isn't the answer. Uh, taking some drugs or alcohol to make me forget my life isn't the answer. There's only one answer, and that is a true and living God. Amen. That's good. But we have to get to that place where many people aren't. You see, many people 
are going to be like Pharaoh, which brings me to my last point, number three. Notice not only the display of God, notice the decision of Pharaoh. You'd think Pharaoh would say, okay, uncle. Watch what he does, verse 8. Then a Pharaoh called for Moses. Can you imagine him being Pharaoh up there and people coming in and saying, King, uh, with all due respect, can we get rid of these frogs? I mean, what are we going to do? And as they're trying to get into his courtroom, stepping over these things. And then we read in verse 8, he, he, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And uh, Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. I'll get to that in a moment. What is Pharaoh going to do with all these frogs? He got a problem. There's a lot of noise around. Ribbit, ribbit, ribbit everywhere. You ever been around a pond at night where there's a bunch of frogs? My soul, shut up already. <laughs> you know, you go out to camp to try to get some peace and quiet. And you, hear, rant, rant, ribbit, 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 you know, it's like, all right, I've got to get used to these noises. And that's what he was hearing. Uh, can you imagine uh, the stink? Frogs stink, by the way. If you ever had one do a little number on your hand or something like that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it's not a pleasant odor, okay? Uh, they do. You ever handle one? It's just the way, way it is. Now, now in verse 8, he, he comes to Moses, he says, entreat the Lord. Now it almost, when I was reading that up to that point, it's almost as if he's saying, I give up, I surrender. He, go ahead, uh, do what you got to do. Go to God, tell him I give in, tell him he can let the, uh, 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 let the people go. I'll do exactly what he says. And what's interesting is, is God said, or Moses said to Pharaoh in verse 9, he asked him, give me a specific time when he wanted to, you want the frogs to be removed. And he says, tomorrow. That's weird if you ask me. That's insane. In fact, there's another book. I think, I think Hugh Powell wrote Another Night with the Frogs. I think. I forget who wrote it. Maybe not him. But it's actually a sermon. And there's a whole sermon on that. But he says tomorrow. You know, that's such a, that's such a wonderful demonstration of the blindness of sin. <laughs> sin is so blind. People procrastinate getting saved. Think about that. Uh, Christians procrastinate dealing with our sin. Well, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll take care of that sin a little later. And right now is not a good time. You know, I'll, I'll deal with those issues in my family uh, another time. I'll get involved with the work of God uh, another time, a little bit later. I'll get my life right with God in a little bit. You know, I'm working on it. That's how a lot of people view it. That is the deceitfulness of sin. He says tomorrow. But Moses obliges. Gives him one more night with frogs. And the next day, he does, Moses, exactly what he said. He cries to the Lord in verse 12. And notice, all the frogs die. They're everywhere. You think shoveling snow and plowing snow is bad. <laughs> you just try shoveling dead frogs and plowing dead frogs and piling them up in a heap. I mean, can you see it? Just pushing mounds of frogs and And the Bible even says that the land began to stink. I mean, it reeked. It absolutely reeked. And you'd think uh, that uh, Pharaoh would say, okay, here you go, but notice in verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw there was respite, watch this, when he saw there was relief, when he saw that the frogs were gone, when he saw that his problem went away, he changes his mind. He changes his mind. And he says, those Jews are not going anywhere. They're staying right here. Why did he do this? I'll tell you why. And here's the whole crux of the message. Pharaoh was never truly seeking God. He was only seeking relief. That's all he wanted. He wasn't seeking the Lord for who the Lord is to worship him. He just wanted his problems to go away. Do you know that according to the Christian Post, an article they did August of 2011, they said in America, this is what the article said, in America from 1999 to 2000, the weekly church attendance in America was the lowest it's ever been in our nation's history. Get the date, 1999 to 2000. Well, September 2011 comes around. Do you know that after the World Trade Center disaster, after that had happened, they said that millions, millions of people right after that flocked yeah. to churches, <laughs> flocked. 
I mean, there were some areas, and I'm not sure if it was New York City or not, but there were some areas where they were jammed. Churches that were half dead, now filled with people. But they said this also in that article, in the study, they said a, a few months after that, just a few months, it went right back to the pre-attack levels. Why? People like to say, oh, revival happened. Revival didn't happen. Right. It's the same thing we, we, we see all along. People seeking God so that he gets rid of their trials, gets rid of their troubles. Not for him, but really for their own sake. Uh, think about that. So can I ask you something today? Why are you here? I'm glad you're here. Don't get me wrong. Please stay. Come back tonight. <laughs> but as, as I said, God's interested in the why. Why are you here? Why am I here? Why do people seek God? Do you know that many lost people seek God for relief instead of regeneration? How many know what I'm talking about? Right? In other words, they, some things happen in their lives. Some catastrophe. Uh, something, maybe they lost their job. Or maybe they, they experienced the death of a loved one. Maybe they're in the midst of some of the greatest marital difficulties they've ever faced. Maybe a threat to leave by a spouse, or they even did leave. Maybe they're going through problems with their children. Maybe they've been caught up with some sin or caught in some sin that has brought, has brought great destruction to their lives. Perhaps drugs or alcohol or pornography. Now understand something. Don't misread what I'm saying. God uses those circumstances and I'm glad that he does. Uh, that's one of the things, the death of a loved one, that brought me to the Lord Jesus Christ. But understand something else, that although God does use that, many people do not come to God because of God. They come to God to get their problems to go away. And they'll do, many times, whatever's necessary to get out of the jam. Uh, they, they, they'll say some prayer you tell them to say, some sinner's prayer, here, say this. And they, they do it, but there's no repentance, there's no faith. They say, oh, Lord, please save me. In their mind, they're thinking, Lord, please fix my life. This is such a mess. And there's no regeneration. That's right. They're not saved. They'll even go to the waters of baptism because they're so desperate to do whatever. I'll do some religious deed. I'll, I'll do it. I'll say this prayer. You can dunk me in the water. And they, they come out of the water thinking, okay, is it going to get better now? All kinds of things. But the problem is, there's no repentance. There's no conviction of sin. They're just in it to get rid of their problems. And you know, the telltale sign that they are seeking relief instead of regeneration is that when their problems get fixed, they're nowhere to be found. That's right. And you and I know people, you've seen this cycle over and over again. They're, they have problems, man, they're in church, they're at it. They want to win the world to Jesus Christ. They want to do whatever it takes because they're in such a jam. And then things get better, and then you don't see them. I mean, they were on this mountaintop. They were ready to go. They were ready to take the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Christians can do the same thing. It's not just unbelievers that do this. We can do the same thing. We can seek uh, uh, not relief instead of regeneration. We can seek well-being instead of worship. I want my problems to go away. You know, many believers, their, their brand of Christianity is very circumstantial. It's based on their circumstances. When things are going bad, when their marriage is on the rocks, when their finances are in the tank, when they've been caught committing some sin, they run to church. Again, the right thing to do. God uses that. Let's get them in. Let's use, let's minister to them while we can. But the reason is vitally important. And if they disappear, as soon as their problems go away, that's a pretty good indication that they had the wrong motive. So today I want to ask, what's your motive? What's my motive? You know, we're not to serve the Lord or even obey the Lord in order to get things from Him. That's not why we're supposed to do it. Well, I'm going to come to church this way. God gets me a job. That's not why you should do it. You should serve the Lord whether you have a job or not. 
You should worship him and obey him whether you have a job or not, whether the finances are good or the finances are bad. Uh, people think, I'll, I'll go to church uh, uh, until my life is smooth, or, or you know, uh, some people come only when they feel on the mountaintop. But we're not to serve God that way. We are to serve God, here it is, ready, because of who he is. Amen. That's why. You should be here today because of who he is. Amen. Not because I, I, I feel like or don't feel like being here. Not because I want to serve or don't want to serve. It's because of who he is and what he's done for me and you by Amen. saving our souls. Amen. You see, that is the true motive for serving the Lord. You see, he is worthy of our worship. Amen. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our service. He is worthy of our all, whether he gives me a plum nickel or not. Amen. Whether he makes my problems go away or not. He still is God. He still is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is still the creator of all mankind who is worthy to be worshipped. So I ask you again, why are you here? Why do you do what you do? Is your Christianity based on your circumstances? Are you serving Him for the right reasons? Perhaps we could say this. Time will tell. Time will tell. God help us all. We have a wonderful God. Amen. Oh, He saved our souls if you're saved. And we ought to be willing to do anything, anything, just simply based on who he is. Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us today.